All right. Good evening, everybody. Good to see everybody out tonight. We are so glad that you are here. We're glad that you're joining us online. If you happen to be doing that tonight, thank you so much for tuning in. And uh, we look forward to our study tonight in uh, the book of Zephaniah. We are still there and we're still studying about all of the things that uh, Zephaniah had to say. And um, tonight we're going to um, wrap it up a little bit early um, so that we will celebrate. Uh, today, if you did not know, is Administrative Professionals Day. And so this is the time when we choose to celebrate Miss Maureen and all that she does for the church. Yeah, that's good. Give her a hand. We appreciate everything that she does. And so we want to celebrate her tonight a little bit. And so we'll wrap up just a little bit early. Let's go ahead and open in a word of prayer. And then we will get kicked off over in the book of Zephaniah or Zechariah. We already did Zephaniah, didn't we? I'm over in Zechariah. All right. So um, Zephaniah, and we'll be there shortly. All right, let's pray. Father, we just come to you right now. We thank you so much for all the things that you do for us, Father. We thank you for the blessings that you give. We thank you for being able to celebrate, Father. We thank you for being able to um, worship together and come into your house, Father. We thank you for the fact of knowing that, God, there is one way to heaven. And you showed us that way very clearly when, you, when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through me. Father, help us to make sure that in all we do, that we share Jesus with those that we come in contact with. Tonight, as we study the book of Zechariah, Father, I, I thank you for the, uh, the messages, Father, that we've been studying. These are minor prophets. They're only minor, Father, because um, the books are smaller. But God, the message they have is major. And tonight, the, the message that we see is very important and it's something that we need to take to heart. Father, I thank you for everything that you do. And I thank you for loving us, for creating us. And Father, most of all, I thank you for Jesus. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So one more time to clarify, it is not Zephaniah. That's my slip of the tongue. It is Zechariah. Okay. We are in Zechariah and we're over in chapter... 11. Bill's got it. He's on top. So Zephaniah, Zechariah, come on, Zephaniah, get out of my mouth. Zechariah chapter 11, and uh, I'm locked up in, over in, in Zephaniah. So Zechariah chapter 11. So we're going to pick up right there, and we're going to begin in verses 1 through 3. Verses 1 through 3. Open your doors, O Lebanon, that fire may devour your cedars. Well, O Cyprus, for the cedar has fallen, because the mighty trees or ruined. Well, O oaks of Bashan, for the thick forest has come down. There is the sound of wailing, shepherds, for their glory is in ruins. Theirs is the sound of roaring lions, for the pride of the Jordan is in ruins. So what we're talking about here is a coming judgment, okay? It is a coming judgment, and remember that as we study these uh, prophets, they are doing just that. They're prophesying. There are things in, in part of the uh, prophets that were um, pre-exilic and then some post-exilic. And this is a post-exilic, meaning they have returned from exile. And the messages, the words that they're hearing, some of the earlier words from Zechariah were for then and, and when they first came back. Now, the words that Zechariah is sharing are prophecies to come. Okay, and so these prophecies to come, many of the prophecies that Zechariah talks about have already happened. Others have not yet happened. And so we're going to take a look tonight at a lot of that. So um, Lebanon, all right, uh, this first one through three verses um, concerns the uh, coming destruction of the armies uh, coming on judgment of God's people. They're going to be coming from the north through Lebanon. And so the, uh, the doors of Lebanon are, can, are what they call the mountain passes between Lebanon and Israel. That's the doors of Lebanon. And so um, they're going to be coming through the, the, all of the cedars and the oaks and all of the wood that is talking about in this. 
were well documented. They were sold all over the world. They were some of the best timber. All of that was something incredible. And so as they did all of that, it was important to understand that those things that they held so dearly were going to be destroyed. They were going to be destroyed, and it was going to happen through a judgment on God's people, okay? So through a judgment on God's people, this was going to happen. So we talked about some of the things where God's people have come back, and we've talked about how God would use people to judge his people, but then he also would turn around and judge the ones he used. So in this case, it's talking about this destruction that's going to come um, from the north. It's going to come through the doors of Lebanon, through the mountain pass between Lebanon and Israel. And this prophecy has already happened. So this particular prophecy has already happened. It actually happened when the Romans came in against Judea. The Romans came in and they destroyed all of those things. They came through there. They tore down all the trees. They did all of that destruction as they came in and they, they um, came against Judea. And so all of this that came through, God's people had a terrible time with the Romans. If you remember, the Romans oppressed God's people for a very long time. If you understand, when, we, when Jesus came along and we're talking about Christ, who was in control? Rome. Rome had already come in. They had already brought God's people into an oppressive state. They had already had a Roman rule going on, and all of that happened. And Zephaniah is telling that 400 years before. He's talking to Zechariah. Y'all, I'm so sorry. I don't know why Zephaniah will not come, will not stay out of my mouth tonight. Zechariah is telling all of that like 400 years before. And so this prophecy he's letting them know is going to happen. These verses could have been described in the Babylonian invasion, but that had already happened. It had already happened before um, Zechariah's time. And so in this time, it is the Romans. He says, Well, O Cyprus, the cedar has fallen. The cedar trees are an illustration of Lebanon's strength. It's, as I talked about before, these trees, these cypress and cedar and oak and all of that are all strengths that they had, and they're uh, illustrations of that. And so with all that torn down, it would definitely be a saddening thing for that region because this was some of their um, very world-renowned things that they were known for. And so he's saying, hey, this is going to happen. This judgment is going to happen. He says, wailing shepherds, roaring lions. So in addition to the trees, the shepherds and the lions are mourning because judgment has come and is coming on the land, and Israel has rejected God. This happened. All of this had happened, and that's exactly when Rome came in, when the Israelites had rejected God. They had turned away. They weren't doing what they were supposed to, and God brought judgment on the land. He came through Lebanon, came down from the north onto Judea, and absolutely destroyed them, put them into a Roman rule, and so they were under Roman rule all the way up until after Christ, right? So we know that that was what was going on. This is before any of that ever happened. Zechariah is telling all of that, and he's the one that's sharing this with them. So um, these prophecies that we, that we see, it's amazing sometimes when we can look back and see that there was a prophecy that happened there, but it actually came to fruition over 400 years later. These prophecies that were told, you know, we wonder sometimes, I do, I wonder sometimes how much longer before Jesus comes back. You know, there's a prophecy that Jesus is going to return. It's been told to us that Jesus is going to return. Jesus himself said he would return. So we know that he's going to return. And many people would look at it and say, y'all are so sad. Y'all are just terrible, you know. It's, it's sad to think about that y'all are so wrapped up in this that you believe that he's coming back. Listen, this was written, you know, all these years ago, over 2,000 years ago, and he hasn't come back yet. What makes you think he's going to come back now? Because it says so. It says he is. It's going to happen. And all of the prophecies that are written have happened. We, we've seen these other prophecies that have come true. So we know this is going to happen. Yes, it may be hundreds of years even from now. 
We don't know when, but we know it's going to come true. Zechariah on that day, and he's telling that prophecy, there were probably many that didn't believe that that could happen. They just didn't believe that it could happen, but it did. And that prophecy came true. So the time frame sometimes throws all of us off because we're very impatient. We're very impatient. And if we have to wait that long, it must not be true. You know, if somebody says, hey, I'm, I'm coming to see you, and you set up waiting and they hadn't made it and they hadn't made it, you might give them a 30-minute window, and then you're like, well, they obviously ain't coming. And, you know, we forget all about it. Um, Jesus said, I'm coming, but he didn't give us a time frame. He didn't give us a window. In Zechariah's day, he told the people this was going to happen. He didn't give them an exact time frame, but he told them it was going to happen. And the people didn't really believe it, but it did happen. Look at verses 4 through 7. Thus says the Lord my God, feed the flock for slaughter, whose owners slaughter them and feel no guilt. Those who sell them say, Bless to the Lord, for I am rich, and their shepherds do not pity them. For I will no longer pity the inhabitants of the land, says the Lord, but indeed I will give every one into his neighbor's hand and into the hand of his king. They shall attack the land, and I will not deliver them from their land. From their, uh, from their hand. So I fed the flock for slaughter, in particular the poor of the flock. I took for myself two staffs, one called beauty, and the other I called bonds, and I fed the flock. So Zechariah in this particular passage is actually acting this out. When it says he took the rod in each hand and he did the things, he's actually acting it out in front of the people so they can get a visual. You know, visual aid is very nice to have. Um, one of the things I love about camp when the students go to camp is most of the, the, the pastors that, that speak to those students have visual aids. Um, they've had some that had a Rubik's Cube. They've had some that had big giant dice. They've had some that had, you know, like a living room. They've had all kinds of stuff. And, you know, all of these different things are visual aids and they help you remember things. I did one here one time where I was talking about it when we try to build walls to keep everybody out, what we really do is put ourselves in a box. And I built walls around myself and enclosed myself in a box on stage. And, you know, that's something that you can visualize how that is. And so when Zach, uh, Zachariah was actually doing this, he was acting it out. As he's telling them the prophecy, he's acting it out so they can see. Zechariah acted out. He actually fed a flock of sheep that represented the people of God. He actually did that. Uh, as a shepherd, Zechariah represented the Lord who had appointed this flock. But this was a flock that was going to be judged. He still fed them, right? He fed them. He said, I took for myself two staffs. The staffs were named beauty and bonds, which also can be translated grace and unity. Grace and unity were the two staffs that he had in his hands. And these uh, staffs were talking about the things that the shepherd held in his hand for the flock. He held grace and unity in his hand for the flock. A staff is what, you know, shepherds used to help keep the flock in the way it needed to be. He had two. He had one that was unity and one that was grace. And it was a common tool that he used. Um, beauty symbolizes the favored status of Israel as the chosen people. Uh, the chosen people of God, actually. And then the union or the bond symbolizes the internal harmony of the people uh, that was lost at the time of the siege of Jerusalem. So they had this internal harmony until they had the siege. They had this, um, this uh, grace and uh, favor from God because he was, they were the chosen people. And, and so Zechariah, as he's acting this out, He's showing them the flock that he's feeding. It is a chosen flock, but it's also a flock that is going to receive judgment. It's a flock that something's going to happen as he acts all of this out. And the people can understand when they see this picture because they understand shepherds. They understand the flocks. They understand all of those things that they're doing. And so he's helping them to see this is a chosen flock. I'm feeding it as a shepherd. I have two staffs, one for unity and one for grace that I'm, I'm holding them together with right now. But I want you to understand this flock is going to receive a judgment. 
the flock represented the people of Israel. I think that was something they could finally see as he acted that out. Look at verses 8 through 11. It says, I dismissed the three shepherds in one month. My soul loathed them, and their soul also abhorred me. Then I said, I will not feed you. Let what is dying die, and what is perishing perish. Let those that are left eat each other's flesh. And I took my staff, beauty, and I cut it in two, that I might break the covenant which I had made with all the people. So it was broken on that day. Thus the poor of the flock who were watching me knew that it was the word of the Lord. It says, I dismissed three shepherds in one month. Now that's a little confusing. And, um, you know, trying to figure out what are the three shepherds. There's, there's several different um, possible things that theologians have come up with. But perhaps the, the best uh, explanation is the oldest. And the three shepherds would represent um, the prophets, the priests, and the kings. And that's who God had given to lead the people, the prophets, the priests, and the kings. And Zechariah said he hated all of them. He hated all of them. Why? Because they all acted ungodly in God's sight. Every one of them acted badly. And so he says that God is saying, I dismissed all of them. God is saying, I dismissed all of them. They did not do what they were supposed to do. So I loathe them, I, I, I despise them, and I have gotten rid of them. He said, I'm, I will not feed you. Let what's dying die. That's pretty harsh. Let's stop and think about that. I will not feed you. Let what is dying die. Just let it happen. So God basically, he didn't kill them, but he took his hand of protection away. That's what he's saying. My hand of protection is going to be taken away from you. It was, by the way, it was taken away. And that's when the invasion happened. That's when the people were to captive. That's when all of that happened. And this covenant uh, that he had with all the people, he took it away. This covenant prevented people from attacking them, but he decided to break the covenant, and therefore he would no longer protect them. He would leave them to be. If they were going to die, they were going to die. Well, when he did, the people were going to be attacked, and they were. Um, he said, let those who are left eat each other's flesh. This is hard to say. That happened. That actually happened. It was prophesied, and in A.D. 70, uh, during the Roman siege of Jerusalem, because they put blockades around and they cut them completely off and they kept all the food and water and everything else from them, as they died, they ate one another's flesh. So he said, let those that are left eat each other's flesh. They actually did that. The poor of the flock knew that it was the word of God. Basically, the poor is the remnant, the ones that still understood this was the word of God. This was just the few, because you understand a remnant means it's not the majority. A remnant means it's just a handful. It's just the few that are left that actually still believe. They understood this is the word of God. The rest of them looked at it and were just like, that can't be true. That can't be true. There's no way. Do you see how, how great we are? Do you see the, the, the Lebanon and how strong it is? There's no way that this could happen. But the few said, yes, it can, and it did. Today, it's the same way. Today, there are so many people in this world that say, well, you know, um, it, there's no way that, that God would allow all these people to die and spend an eternity in hell. There's just no way. That, that wouldn't happen. It would never be that bad. There's no way there's going to be uh, this terrible rule of an antichrist. That's not going to happen. None of this could possibly be true, but there's a remnant. There's a small amount of God's people that still believe and understand this is true. And unfortunately, we're the small voice. We're the small voice. And we're getting smaller and smaller as a voice. The people of God that understand this need to speak up. We need to be telling those around us about it because it's coming. It's coming. You know, most of the time when an invasion happens, nobody comes up and says, okay, on Thursday at 3 o'clock, I'm coming to invade your land. 
and I'm going to bring all my ships and my ground forces and everything, and I'm coming Thursday at 3 o'clock, and I'm going to invade. Just have, they just do it. It happened suddenly. There may have been warning signs. There may have been, you know, some, as they say, saber rattling. There may have been some things that were indicators that it might happen, but nobody really believed it until it happened. Nobody ever would have believed that the United States would be attacked on our own soil until 9-11. Nobody would ever have believed it. They didn't advertise it on 9-10 and tell everybody it's going to happen. On 9-11, it just suddenly happened and it rocked the world. This invasion that we're talking about, it was told way ahead of time it was going to happen, but not exactly when. They didn't believe it. The Antichrist has been prophesied. But the problem with the Antichrist is the Antichrist is not going to suddenly appear one day and say, hey, people, I'm the Antichrist. I, I'm the one. I'm the Antichrist. No, we know the Antichrist is going to be a very wonderful communicator, is going to be a very talented orator. It's going to be someone that gives all of the um, thoughts and ideas of unity and bringing people together and doing all of these things, and people are going to fall in love with the Antichrist because they don't realize that's who it is. Why? Because they're not paying attention. They're not paying attention. Versus... I do. I do, um, because the Antichrist is supposed to be kind of a, a mirror of Christ, right? And so as Christ came as a child and grew up as a man, the same, I think, will happen with the Antichrist. Yeah. Well, there have been, there have been, in just my lifetime, there have been many people who pointed at someone and said, "I think that's the Antichrist." My, my when I was, I guess I was in high school then. I may have been a little older anyway. When when Brady was shot in the head and he didn't die, a lot of people said, "That's the Antichrist. He had a fatal wound and he didn't die. That's going to be him." Right, and Gorbachev had a mark. You know, there have been many, and some said Obama because, you know, he was a smooth talker and he had a gift of, for bringing, you know, people to do the things he wanted them to do. And, I mean, there was a lot of things. So there are a lot of people that have pointed and said, this one, this one, this one. But the point is, there's nothing that says Antichrist as a name tag. We're not going to see it that easily. God's people should be able to tell if we are looking closely through the lens of this. Those are all speculations based off when it talks about Antichrist in the Bible and where Antichrist will originate. But just because they originate there doesn't mean that they were born and grew up there. So I don't know that. The reason I bring up the Antichrist, I want you to look with me at verses 12 through 14. It says, Then I said to them, If it is agreeable to you, give me my wages, and if not, refrain. So they weighed out for my wages 30 pieces of silver. And the Lord said to me, Throw it to the potter, that princely price they set on me so that I took the 30 pieces of silver and I threw them in the house of the Lord for the potter. Then I cut it into my other staff bonds that I might break the brotherhood between Judah and Israel. Okay. So we're kind of getting there. <clears throat> Again, remember Zechariah was acting out this prophecy and he was broke this staff 
it says, first of all, they paid him his wages and they weighed out 30 pieces of silver. That seems important for some reason. I don't know why it seems important. Actually, I, I want to tell you about the 30 pieces of silver. The 30 pieces of silver were a common wage. The lowest possible wage of a slave. So when he says, you pay out my wages, they weighed out the 30 pieces of silver, which was the absolute least amount they could possibly pay. It was the price of a slave. It was the lowest they could pay. And what it says is they regarded Zechariah as a slave. Okay, they regarded him as a slave, lowest possible price. If you remember, the other place that we want to talk about the 30 pieces of silver was in Matthew, right? Jesus was betrayed for the price of a slave. The lowest possible price. The salvation, the Savior, was betrayed for the lowest possible price. When we read that in Matthew, we don't understand that that 30 pieces of silver was actually a very small price. But it was. It was the lowest possible price. And so uh, Jesus was betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. What else did he do? It says here, throw them. he threw them into the house of the Lord for the potter. When Judas got his 30 pieces of silver, what did he do? He bought the potter's field. Now, a potter's field, if you don't know what that is, a place where they threw all their broken pottery, all their junk. It was a junkyard. That's what a potter's field was. It was a junkyard where they threw all their broken pottery and the pieces that didn't work right or that were too old or whatever. They threw all that out in this field. That was their junkyard. That's where they threw it all. Well, he went and bought the potter's field. This money, it says, throw it in for the potter. Ma'am, it was in this situation, and it can be, but the majority of the property is normally they don't put them in the graveyard because it is, it's unclean and un, everything about it is a bad place. It's a junkyard. So they don't typically use it as a graveyard, but we know in the case of Judas, it was. He purchased the potter's field, and that's where they left him. So... um. Zechariah said the 30 pieces of silver were thrown into the house of the Lord, but they were also given to the potter. That's exactly what happened with Judas. He bought that field. He says, then I cut in two my other staff bonds that I might break the brotherhood between Judah and Israel. And so then after exchanging the 30 pieces of silver, the, the staff was broken. And this full, uh, was fulfilled when Israel was scattered by the Romans uh, after the rejection of their shepherd. Unity was broken. Remember that second staff is named unity. He broke the bond, staff bond, the unity bond. He broke that as a symbol of what was going to happen to God's people. And that is exactly what happened when the Roman rule came in. They scattered them everywhere. And instead of being unified, they were scattered. And so, ma'am, yes, ma'am, that's when, that's when all that was happening. Um, and so they were scattered. Um, <clears throat> so, um, <clears throat> I want to take a quick look at 15 and 16. It says, and the Lord said to me next, take for yourself the implements of a foolish shepherd. For indeed, I will raise up a shepherd in the land who will not care for those who are cut off, nor seek the young, nor heal those that are broken, nor feed those that are still stand, but he will eat the flesh of the fat and tear their hooves in pieces. <sighs> the foolish shepherd. Zechariah is play acting this foolish shepherd who did not care for the sheep. This foolish shepherd would not seek the young. A wise shepherd knows that you need to seek the young because they need to come to the Lord just like the older do. Um, this foolish shepherd would uh, not feed those that were still standing, but obviously a faithful shepherd feeds the sheep. A foolish shepherd will eat the flesh of the fat and tear their hooves, but a wise, godly shepherd 
will lay down his life for the sheep. I will raise up a shepherd in the land. Now, this foolish shepherd that he's talking about raising up in the land, um, this foolish shepherd was allowed and, and appointed uh, by God's judgment for judgment on the people. It fulfilled Israel's rejection of Jesus. They rejected the good shepherd, but they accepted the foolish shepherd. Again, Matthew chapter 27 says this will ultimately be fulfilled. Um, I'm sorry, this is Daniel. It says it will ultimately be fulfilled in their embrace of the Antichrist and their covenant with him. Zechariah, way back then, is talking about the Antichrist, the foolish shepherd, the people will reject the good shepherd, and the foolish shepherd will be accepted. The people will turn away from God and they will accept the Antichrist. They're going to follow the Antichrist. They're going to turn away from God when all that comes to be. Zechariah is saying this judgment that is happening is because the people have turned away from God. He is allowing this to occur. Now, we know that it's already been prophesied. We know it's already going to happen because God already knows that his people are going to turn away. All this is already going to happen, and it's going to happen. We know that the Antichrist will only be able to rule for a small amount of time. But he's telling them this is going to happen, and the people still with blinders on don't believe it. Today, there are people that still don't believe that the Antichrist is going to be. But I want to tell you something even scarier. There's more than one Antichrist. What? Everything that's not Christ is Antichrist. So that means there are a lot of Antichrists in the world. Everyone who is against Christ is an Antichrist. So there are a lot of them in the world today that are continuing to help turn people away from God. Away from God. Verse 17 says, Woe to the worthless shepherd who leaves the flock. A sword shall be against his arm and against his right eye. His arm shall completely wither, and his right eye shall be totally blinded. God will allow this foolish shepherd, because of God's people rejecting the good shepherd, but it doesn't mean that he approves of the foolish shepherd. God will judge this worthless shepherd, just like he judged the kings that he used to bring um, judgment on God's people in the past. He will judge this foolish shepherd the same. When he says the sword shall be against his arm and against his right eye, that means that he's going to have some severe wounds. We just talked about somebody having severe wounds. In Revelation, it tells us the Antichrist will suffer a severe wound yet survive. This confirms the worthless shepherd is ultimately fulfilled as the Antichrist. This passage, although short, is a very big warning of what is still to come. Some has already happened. We saw some of it happen through the Roman rule. Now he finishes off this passage talking about the coming of the Antichrist and God's people turning away from him before that happens so that they do turn to the Antichrist when he comes. So we know that these are things that can happen. We know that the only way that we will understand when those things happen is when we look at it through the lens of this word. We've got to stay in this word. We've got to study this and be prepared and be on the lookout. The Bible tells us to be um, as watchmen in the night, right? Because we never know what hour or what day that Jesus will return. So <clears throat> we'll close out tonight the end there of chapter 11 we'll pick up next week chapter 12 um in zechariah not zephaniah yes ma'am well that's that's why we study it right because it's easy to read some of this and not know what it's talking about and um for all of us we have to study because otherwise we might not know and God reveals it to us when we study. He shows us the things that we need to know. Um, 
Again, we'll pick back up next week. For those of you who have joined us online, thank you so much for being here. God bless and good night.